So hi everybody, my name is Brian Gainsler. I am an astronomer at the University of Toronto, where I direct the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics. So I wanted to be an astronomer since I was three or four years old, and it's just an incredible joy to know that I actually got to become an astronomer. Uh, I work on uh, explosions and invisible gas throughout space. I get to use some of the largest telescopes in the world. Uh, I grew up in Australia. I worked for in the United States for 10 years, and then I went back to Australia for 10 years. And now I've been in Canada for almost 10 years. So my job has taken me all around the world and I've got to live in lots of different countries, make discoveries, work with brilliant people, use some of the most complicated pieces of equipment that anybody has ever built and figure things out that nobody else was able to ever figure out before. Uh, do you mind if we just jump right, right into the, some of the student questions? Absolutely. Okay, so some of them are going to email to me, and guys, you here on the chat, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and, and we'll get to you. But one of the kids wanted to know, when you were growing up, what was the first moment that you realized that this is what you wanted to pursue in life? So um, it was when my parents bought me a, a book, and let me uh, put it on the screen. So you can see my background is uh, this cool-looking sort of space background and um, my parents bought me this book. This is the cover of a book called Album of Astronomy. And I read it when I was about four or five and it just blew me away because every other book that I'd seen had all the answers. This is what dinosaurs look like, or this is how volcanoes work. And this book said, we don't know anything. We have no idea what's going on. And, and the idea that there were things that nobody knew the answer to, I had never thought of that before. And so, so astronomy, captured for me the idea that there's just things that nobody knows and that you get a chance to figure them out. And so that's the moment when I decided that I wanted to be a scientist and astronomer. I wanted to figure things out that nobody knew the answers to. Uh, one of the kids that, first of all, that's great. And, I'm, and thank you so much for getting that graphic. That's really, really cool um, in the background. One of the kids wanted to know what it has been your best memory of your career so far. Oh gosh, there's been there's been so many, um, and a lot of them involve people. Because one of the best things about science is that science isn't about working by yourself. It's working with lots of really amazing people from all around the world. But uh, you're probably asking for about a scientific discovery. So uh, the day after Christmas in 2004, I got an email from a colleague saying urgent. Um, we think this star has exploded. Can you use your telescope to have a look at it? And I was thinking, oh, look, it's Christmas break. I'm not in any hurry, but I'll have a quick look. And what we saw was the brightest explosion that had ever been seen in the history of humanity. Uh, this thing was outshone the sun by factors of millions. It, no, we had never seen anything like it. It was complete shock that any star could be this bright and uh, that completely changed our understanding of the sorts of things that happen in space, so explosions and flares and bursts. And it still remains today sort of a textbook example of how violent the universe can get. So that was probably the most exciting thing because we were not expecting this. And then once we saw this, we had to basically drop everything, find every single telescope we could and point every telescope in the world at this to watch the expanding debris cloud get larger and slowly fade away from this massive explosion. Now, uh, this is I, just this is my own ignorance. I just want to ask this question. Is that, does that happen in real time where, when you're watching that star or is that something that happened in the past and we're just seeing it now because of the way light travels? 
It's the second one of those. So this particular star was about 20,000 light years away. So this particular explosion actually happened in the year 18,000 BCE, but the light was just getting to us in 2004. So over the entire history of humanity, this light was traveling towards us while people were building the pyramids and during the Roman Empire and during the Middle Ages, this light was traveling towards us. We didn't know it was coming and then it hit us in 2004. So uh, this is something that has been in preparation for the entire span of recorded history. That hurts my head to wrap, uh, wrap, <laughs> wrap it around that. That's absolutely incredible. So it, light travels that fast, but it still takes. So how far, again, I'm, I'm riffing here. I, this is my question. How, what's like the furthest away that you have seen uh, an object or a star? Um, so... Me, me personally or astronomers in general? You, you personally. Um, I would say that the most distant object is probably about, I want to say about 11 or 12 billion light years away. So the star I was just talking about, it takes 20,000 years to travel to that star at the speed of light. Uh, the most distant objects I've studied, it takes 11 or 12 billion years to travel from those objects to us. And that means that the sun and the earth did not even exist when that light was emitted. And so this light's been traveling towards us, not just for the whole of human history, but uh, the whole time that the sun formed and the, the earth formed and then uh, the first animals appeared and the dinosaurs and everything else. One of the kids wanted to know, what are some of the, um, what are some of the tools that you use in your day-to-day -day job? Like, I know that we know that you're a professor, but in your day to day job, as far as astronomy and physics and all that. Yeah. So unfortunately, astronomers don't get to go to telescopes very often anymore. Uh, a lot of telescopes are very complicated and we don't get to use them. There are trained operators. So uh, an exciting day might be an email. Uh, I get an exciting day might be a day where I get an email saying your data is ready and uh, click on this link to download your data. And I click on the link and the data sets are very large, so it might take a day or two to download the data, even on a high speed internet connection. And then when it's finally downloaded to my computer, I can have a look at it. So a typical day uh, it involves sitting in front of a computer. And so if you watch me, it wouldn't look very exciting. I'm just staring at the screen and typing away. But what's going on in the screen is really amazing. So we use a lot of software, special astronomy software that we use to turn the data stream into pictures and to make measurements from those pictures, like how far away an object is, or how heavy it is, or how hot it is, or how fast it's moving. So it's all on computers these days, but the sorts of things you can do on a computer are just extraordinary. There were things that 20 years ago would take months that I can now sort of do in an hour because of the sorts of sophisticated software that we now have for turning these complicated data streams into beautiful pictures. Fascinating stuff. We have a question from Andrea in Italy. And Andrea, I'm going to let you unmute and you can ask your question to Dr. Gansler when you're good a second. Go ahead. Okay, so I wanted to ask uh, any advices for someone who wants to in pursue a career like yours? Yeah, so let me give you sort of the, the, the very sort of specific advice and, and the general advice. I think the specific advice is that these days science and making discoveries is all about computers. Uh, so it's important to, if you're interested in astronomy, it's important to know about astronomy. And if you're interested in chemistry, you should know about chemistry, but, but it's all about computers. So even if computers themselves don't excite you, I think it's really important to learn how to write software, uh, to learn how to code, uh, and to be able to manipulate uh, computers. So, so there's all sorts of things going on at the school level that you can do, but a lot of science programs now sort of expect you to be pretty familiar with computers when you start. Um, and the more general advice that I would give is that science is really, really hard. Uh, there are no answers in the back of the book. And whenever you're doing something, it's usually something that nobody has done before. And that's terrifying, but sort of exciting. And so I think the most important lesson I've learned as a scientist is to not give up. Uh, because we tend to give up when things are hard. But in science, if things are feeling hard, it's actually a real, it's a big flashing sign saying you're doing something no one has ever done before. And so whenever I get really frustrated or I'm stuck, um, I remind myself that that's, that's, that's a sign that I might be on the edge of a breakthrough and that's what keeps me going. So that's the general advice I give is that you just have to have a lot of patience and a lot of determination and 
discoveries don't just happen randomly. They come through through sticking with things and working through really hard tasks. That's great advice. Um, one of the kids wanted to know, they emailed, can you explain to us um, some of your research? Because it is, it looks very, very impressive, but for those of us who are not uh, professional astronomers, it, it can be a little uh, hard to wrap our brains around. So <laughs> there was the supernova explosion from magnetars. If you could kind of, could, could you explain that in layman's terms by chance? Sure, yeah. So this was what I was talking about, this huge explosion that happened in 2004. So there's this star, and it's a very strange star. It's only about 30 kilometers across, 20 miles across, which is tiny for a star. So it's about the size of a city. Uh, it's spinning pretty fast. It's spinning about once every 10 seconds, which is pretty fast. The Earth takes 24 hours to spin, and this thing spins every 10 seconds. It's unbelievably hot, this star. It's about 10 million degrees on surface. So it's already a very unusual star. It's very hot, it's very, it's very small, uh, it's spinning very fast. And this star gave off uh, a flare. So our sun gives off flares all the time, and you, there are beautiful pictures of them. And sometimes if the flare is aimed at the Earth, it can disrupt satellites and produce beautiful northern lights. This flare was millions of times stronger than the sun's flare. And if we had been close to this object, this flare would have been so intense that it would have killed all life on Earth. Fortunately, we were 20,000 light years away, which is a safe distance, but it was still very, very strong. It did still knock out satellites. Uh, it disrupted uh, communications. And the idea that a star that's 20,000 light years away could actually affect things on Earth was, was a bit of a shock. So the incredible thing is, is that when this flare was going on, we thought, well, let's wait for this flare to fade away, and maybe the star will be damaged in some way after the flare has faded away. But the incredible thing is that once the flare faded away and we could see the star again, it was exactly the same as it always is. It was the same temperature, it was spinning at the same speed. Uh, it clearly wasn't affected by this at all. And what that tells us is despite the immense energy in this flare, that's just a tiny part of the energy that this star has. So at some point in the future, uh, maybe in the next 20 or 30 years, it'll probably do this again, which is just remarkable, the idea that there, and there are lots of these stars like this one, these magnetars, there's, we know of about 30 of them throughout the galaxy, and it's quite uh, incredible to think that all of these stars uh, are slowly building up to some sort of giant flare that could come from any direction at any time. That is, I mean, just the, it's, it's hard for me to wrap my head around it. And I know, I know the kids, are, some of the kids are kind of the same way, but like, were you guys able to capture that? Like, as far as like the image of that in, in that moment, the uh, one you're describing from 2005? Um, so the start, the actual flare and the explosion are so far away that we could barely make an image. Like the image that the actual image wasn't very exciting. It's just a slowly growing blob. But we were able to use all the different measurements we made to sort of create an artist's impression of what happened. And what we think is, is that the surface layer of the star got blasted out into space in all directions at about half the speed of light. So imagine, imagine you know, this, this sort of cloud of debris just moving out at this incredible speed in all directions. This, it's just absolutely infinite. So uh, I know that we're kind of strapped for time here. So before we let you go, I know you kind of gave some advice on students who want to pursue careers in astronomy, but what if they want to pursue careers in other things, in science and ELA? Uh, as someone who is accomplished as yourself, what kind of advice would you give to these kids as they go off into the world and figure out what they want to do and what they want to pursue? Uh, I guess I'd say a couple of things. One is, is that it's not just all about being smart. Like there's a lot of jobs in the world where you think, oh, I could never do that. That person is so smart. And look, being smart is good, doesn't, doesn't hurt. But I think that if you look at the people who are really successful, it comes back to what I said earlier. It's about, um, it's about you know, the, the English uh, uh, slang is guts. It's about guts. It's about determination. Uh, it's about just not giving up. And you'll see that a lot of the people who are successful were actually failures for many years before they succeeded. It's all a success in, in whatever you want to do is all about not giving up and, and overcoming adversity. And the other thing I would say is that you've, you've got to 
find something about what you do that you really are excited by and that you love. Even if you don't love the details of what you're doing on a Monday or a Tuesday, you've got to keep reminding yourself of the big picture of, of why, why you're doing this. So, you know, when my alarm goes off at six o'clock in the morning, I often think, oh, I don't want to get out of bed. I have a really boring day today. But then I remind myself of like all of these boring things and why they all add up and why they ultimately five years from now are going to result in some discovery. And then I go, oh, right, that's why I'm doing this. So the two things I would say is, is a lot of determination and a refusal to give up and just always remind yourself of the big picture of, of what you're what you're doing and why. That's phenomenal advice, playing the long ball there. And uh, if you guys haven't already, definitely check out uh, his book, Extreme Cosmos. Um, it's on Amazon or is it where else can they get it? Amazon, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so before we let you go, before I end the meeting for all, I'm going to unmute, ask everyone to unmute, and can we all say thank you to Dr. Gansler, and then I'll go ahead and end the meeting for all, and we can uh, go about our day. So thank you so much, Dr. Gansler, for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.